I am Femi O'Kay and you're in the stream. Today, India's fight against malaria. We'll look at how gaps in health data are impacting efforts to eradicate the disease. So we're talking about malaria in India, but this is a disease that's been around for so many thousands of years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, about probably as long as we've been around. Um, but it, it's it's not just relevant about our audience who are India, but mm -hmm. global. Exactly, that's exactly what they're telling us. So Hamel here on Twitter writes in, malaria is a worldwide problem, but poor countries suffer the most. In remote areas, it's largely dangerous because of no quick action. So we'll talk to our guests today about how that's particularly affecting Indians. We want you to join in on this conversation. Use hashtag AJStream. Joining us right here on our set, Ankita Rao is a multimedia journalist. Ankita, it's great to have you here. Thanks, it's great to be here. So we're going to be talking about an investigation that you have actually been working on and Nikita was one of the journalists who worked on a year-long out of zero America investigation into India's anti-malaria program. The report raises questions about whether doctored health data may be hurting the country's fight against the mosquito-borne disease and their findings follow a 2010 study that alleged that malaria deaths in India may be as much as 13 times higher than an estimate by the World Health Organization. So what's being done to address the data gap and how is it impacting Indians? With us to talk about this in London, we have Dr. Yogesh Jain, a public health advocate. He helped found the People's Health Society, and that's a rural health non-profit in India, which also goes by the acronym JSS. In Visakhapatnam, India, Dr. Johnny Uman is a community health physician. And in Baltimore, Maryland, Sonia Shah is a science journalist and author of the book, The Fever, how malaria has ruled humankind for 500,000 years. So I guess it's great to have you here. Ah, and Keita, so this is, this is the question. Yeah. Um, how many people died from malaria last year in India? <laughs> if I could answer that. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> then we could have done and, and end the show. In the world. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, as our investigation says, it's really hard to tell. Mm -hmm. The government reported in the 500s. Um, the World Bank reported something between 20,000 and 40,000. Right. And you have Lancet studies going up to 200,000. What? So what? what? There's, there's what? a huge discrepancy there. Wow. So I'm looking here at my laptop. The National Vector Borne Disease Control Program, mm -hmm. Directorate General of Health Services, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. And so they have, down here, I'm just going to quickly scroll down here, 561 people died mm -hmm. from malaria in 2014. Mm -hmm. Done. Yep. What could be wrong with that figure? Um, I mean, if you talk to any doctor who's worked in rural India, yeah. they'll tell you that there's entire villages that where every single person basically has had malaria in the last year. Um, so I think it's safe Whoa, to say that... that would be that a lot more than 561. <laughs> yes, and wow. it's safe to say that the amount of people dying in a country of that many people is, is not that low. Wow. Mm -hmm. See, Sonia, when I asked about how many deaths there were and... and, and uh, you kind of smiled there too, not because it was funny, but because the numbers are so varied, right? Yeah, and it, just to clarify, the 561 is 561 deaths, right? Mm -hmm. It's not cases. Okay, so they're saying 561 people died of malaria. Right. Well, the, the problem is most people have malaria by themselves. It's, it's, it, it occurs outside of our reporting system, right? And, you know, in places where there's a lot of malaria, small children can have several episodes of malaria before they're two or three years old. Um, so, you know, and, and then you can, can keep having malaria again and again and again, and you come, you, you acquire immunity and you become less likely to die of it. Mm. So I think for most of the malaria that occurs in the world, it's something that kind of comes and goes. It's just that there's so much malaria that the tiny fraction of cases that end in death still can add up globally to a really big number. Um, so I think what's happening in India is kind of a microcosm of what's happened globally with our how we you know how we kind of quantify this disease. We have massive amounts of underreporting because a lot of people are having malaria by themselves. They go get a couple pills from the doctor, or maybe they just wait it out, and you know, and nobody ever hears about those cases. That's probably over ninety percent of the malaria that occurs in the world is occurring outside of the medical system. 
Um, but then you also have a huge amount of overreporting because, you know, as uh, our other uh, the other guests in the show will probably say um, and and describe to us, a lot of people, a lot of doctors just presumptively assume that people have malaria when they come in with fever, um, and you know maybe they have malaria parasites in their body, but they may not be sick with malaria. You know, there's a distinction there too. You can have malaria but not be sick with malaria. Then you also could have malaria, you know, be infected and also be sick from it. So there's just a huge variety of ways in which malaria occurs, um, and so we have a, a lot of underreporting and a lot of overreporting. So where the actual malaria is in between all of that is wow. a very very fuzzy thing. So Dr. Oman, you heard Sonia talk about some of the overreporting and the underreporting. So this one is talking about underreporting in a tweet from Christian who read and Kita, he read your report and this is what he picked up out of it that deaths caused by malaria are attributed to more generic causes and as a result India ends up returning millions of dollars in aid so Dr. Uman how is it that malaria can be attributed to more generic causes it's just a misdiagnosis or tell us what happens there uh, it's not easy to die officially of malaria the issue is this is an official report. So to be able to die officially of malaria, you have to have the fever. You have to go and get tested in a government facility. The facility must work. The test must come positive, And then you must die. That's a sequence that it's not always easy to fit into. Ah. So um, like uh, Sonia said, uh, the gaps are bigger than the, uh, the mainstream. So uh, much of what occurs occurs outside that system. But as he was saying, it's not easily to die, it's not mm -hmm. easy to die from malaria. You, that totally resonated with the reporting that's, that you yeah, found. Yeah, I mean that's exactly what we found. We were trying to trace um, die officially, I should say. Right. Should I quote him correctly? Die officially. Yeah. They, did, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they did die. Um, yeah. But yeah, we were trying to trace. We went, you know, to the very remote villages in, you know, Orissa and Andhra Pradesh where malaria numbers are really high, and we tried to trace a death from the very beginning from that village um, to the state level where the numbers were officially reported, it was impossible. It was like they just disappeared into thin air. They were, you know, we traced a woman's death that said she died of, you know, uh, uh, like cardiovascular failure or other times it would be fever. Um, so it's incredible. You can actually just take a piece of paper, go to the next level and see a malaria death or a malaria case disappear. Dr. Jane, is, is this just incompetent reporting, recording, or just really difficult to actually get the number down absolutely correctly for malaria deaths? How do you I, interpret I think there are, it? Yeah, there are many issues in this. There are many issues in this. One is the, uh, the, the design, uh, the recommendation of the national program uh, about how to record a malaria a death due to malaria is itself flawed, and uh, secondly, it is uh, so in a sense you know if you want, if you do, if you uh, for the sake of not having any any non malaria deaths being reported as malaria deaths, uh, if you want to remove any any even minimal risk of that, then to have a strict criteria like this that it has to be a government health systems. Uh, positive diagnosis of a malaria parasite on a blood smear, you're already eliminating uh, the possibility of dying at home or dying without a smear being made, which, was, which is the case for many. Uh, which, so inaccessibility would be completely, uh, or to healthcare would be completely missed out by such a stringent and, a, and a, you know, impractical criteria. Wow. The other is that, um, uh, in a practical way, the way this is interpreted, so the uh, malaria, you don't die just, uh, you don't die because of the parasite uh, being in, in your blood. It, you, it usually is due to a complication that happens uh, in malaria, mm. whether it is a kidney, kidney failure or whether it's um, uh, respiratory distress or whether it is due to the, uh, the brain uh, getting affected and you lose your uh, will to breathe, your ability to breathe. These are the reasons, approximate causes of death. And often, uh, when you have any of these complications due to severe malaria, uh, the physicians who treat are, uh, are more liable to relate, the, uh, to blame the, uh, the, the approximate uh, medical condition as the cause of death and may miss out on malaria. Mm. 
Okay. Similarly, uh, so, women who have yeah, so it is there's a problem not only in that in the st uh, recommendation by the state of how to define a malaria death, but also its practical use. Sure. I know for one that the malaria officer in Bilaspur would uh, call anyone who got severe anemia or jaundice along with malaria as a, and would die subsequently would be, uh, in spite of a positive smear, he would label the death due to jaundice ah. or due to anemia and not so label it due not to malaria. It's not necessarily, not necessarily corruption or incompetence even, it's just how the disease might actually be recorded as an actual death finally too. It's, it's actually something that we heard a lot from people online. And so, Ankita, I want to uh, pass this video comment we got. This is from Suvojit, and he is actually a development consultant who studied this a lot, and this is what he told us. The government knows that its surveillance system captures only a fraction of the real burden of malaria. They estimate the real number of cases should be about six times higher, and the malaria-attributed deaths about 20 times higher. Most of this are people who go to the private sector for treatment. So we know faulty data means faulty budget decisions. We know that the dependence on private providers can only work if the government steps in and regulates them properly. Why is it then we know so little about how these private providers work? So the, the, the issue of private providers, these are happening outside of large cities and yeah. rural areas, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I think, I think that's a huge issue here is a, a complete misunderstanding of where people are going for treatment. There's a lot of doctors that have sometimes no degrees in villages where people are going when they have a fever. No one knows exactly what they're prescribing, if people are getting better, if people are dying, but they do exist. So, I mean, relying on a government health system, which, you know, already has huge vacancies, huge issues, um, you know, in it already, and then not accounting for the private sector, not regulating the private sector, is definitely where a lot of this is getting lost. I mean, this problem, I, I think everyone will agree, is an open secret, first of all, that everyone knows about, but it's also not something that is only the government's fault or only, you know, an international aid agency's fault. It, it is sort of an all hands on deck, sort of everybody's involved kind of issue. I want to show our audience a picture. Um, this is from your investigation. So this gentleman here is looking after his grandkids mm -hmm. um, and his daughter-in-law died from malaria and, and left um, a, the family behind and he still doesn't quite understand what she died from. Dr. Uman, I'm just wondering as we go beyond the sort of data and the figures and the recording complexity of recording and maybe some incompetence going on, this open secret, who is really suffering because of this? Yeah, if you look at the map of malaria and you look at the map of malnutrition and you look at the map of poverty and illiteracy, they all overlap each other. So these are issues of poverty as well of power, of decision-making, and access to knowledge, access to treatment. All these things are part of the story of uh, who gets malaria. And that's why the underreporting occurs as well. Um, so yes, the people who need the information don't have it. The people who have the information don't get malaria. So it, it's, it's all part of it. You can't take this piecemeal. Malaria is part of a larger fabric. Um, and the people who are in the gaps are in the gaps for many more things besides malaria. So, yes. Sonia, and I'm wondering if you can pick up on that and really just elaborate a little bit further based on what I'm going to show you in a video comment. This is from Vivek, who is actually uh, the co-reporter on your report, this, doc, this, this, this report out of India. And he talks about discrimination playing a role in this. So, Sonia, have a listen to this. Uh, there's a very deeply ingrained attitude within the Indian state that tribal people are simple-minded, that they are somehow incapable of understanding basic facts about health or education, which tends to translate into a certain condescension when government officials interact with tribal people. Uh, this same attitude helps make covering up an epidemic in remote tribal areas much easier than it would be in, say, the cities. And as long as that systemic discrimination continues, as long as the government fails to properly communicate with people in these disease-prone areas, I think malaria will continue to pose a very difficult challenge. So, Sonia, I see you nodding there. How big of a role does discrimination play? Well, I mean, it's true that malaria is intimately connected to poverty. Um, if you're poor, you're more likely to get 
malaria because you live in uh, marginal housing where mosquitoes can come into your house. You don't have electricity, so you're outside more. Um, there's poor drainage around you, so there's standing water where mosquitoes breed. So in all these ways, being poor means you get more malaria. Um, but we also know that having malaria makes you poor too. So, and this has been quantified by economists that um, just by having malaria in a society, it reduces GDP growth by 1.3% every year. And that's year after year after year. So you think about these communities um, that are already poor and they start getting more and more malaria and that becomes a cycle. So, so malaria has rooted itself in the, in the, it's been ghettoized across the globe. And that's true in India. It's also true if you look at the entire global landscape of malaria. Now, 200 years ago, we had malaria in the United States. We had malaria right up until 1930s in the United States. Um, and it, we got rid of it when we kind of uplifted people out of rural poverty. So it was black sharecroppers in the South who used to get a lot of malaria here in the United States. And when their malarious way of life started to end because of economic development, we built malaria out of this country. And that hasn't happened. That's on a global scale yet. So we still have a lot of places in the world where malaria is roosting in these neglected corners of society where people don't have good housing, they don't have access to electricity, they don't have good drainage around their homes. So in the environment is a malarious yeah. environment and they are exposed to it all the time. Cool. Dr. Jane, when you treat the rural communities that you go into, how do you help them combat a disease that's been around probably pretty much as long as we have? How do you help them? Yeah, so let, let me uh, just add, add to what the uh, previous discussion was about. So, you know, uh, in the, according to the government's own data, 8% of the country's population is, uh, is uh, the indigenous community, the tribals, or we call as them as Adivasis. And they account for over 50% of falciparum malaria, the malaria that kills. And they account for 70% of all the deaths that happen due to malaria. So clearly, 8% uh, uh, of the country's poorest people uh, account for 70% of the deaths, uh, even according to the official data. So uh, it, there itself, it, uh, it plays out the, uh, disc the uh, discrimination, in a sense, or the, uh, of, against the poor. Sure. Of which malaria is a classic example of a, a disease of poverty. So, uh, so let's, let's, but let's, in terms let's, let's, of what let's, one can do, yeah, I think... Yeah, let's, let's uh, push on a little bit further, because we, we, we only have so much time. What do you do to help people in this situation? Because then it sounds like, OK, well, then we're stuck. But I don't think you are. Dr. Uman, for instance, what are you doing on the ground? Yeah, so I, my thinking is that part of the problem is policymakers never get malaria. And people who get malaria never make policy. So, uh, you know, your definition of the zoo depends on which side of the bars you're on. Mm. So uh, if you look at malaria from the victim perspective, like they've done in HIV, right? In HIV, you would never plan a program without involving positive people. In malaria, there is an absolute lack of involvement of the ground people, the people who actually get malaria, or the people on the ground who are actually working with it in the final policies. Now, let me just give you an example. In the area that I work in, this is South Orissa, I work in uh, with uh, tribal communities, um, we found that most of our deaths were in children. And we found that waiting for fever to occur was too late to get into the story. And so in 2010, we started offering mothers the opportunity of a blood test for malaria for their children uh, during season, regardless of whether you have fever or not. And we've done this in many districts, and we found about 40% of children were positive. Uh, I'm talking about children under five, with or without wow. fever. Only around 8% actually had fever. 92% of the children who were positive did not have fever. Now, if you say that malaria is, that the symptom of malaria is a fever, then you're going to miss 92%. Mm. Uh, we found that children who are malnourished are very often malnourished because they have chronic recurrent malaria. That's why they're anemic. You push it further into school-going children, you find that why, why can't school performance be affected? So the poverty angle that Sonia talked about has many, many angles to it. Now, what can you do about it? I'm absolutely convinced. The answer cannot come from systems. It comes from people and their own families. So the answer has to be in empowering communities and individuals to protect themselves against malaria. 
and get them access to the tools necessary. So one of the answers we're getting is from Priyanka on Twitter, and she's uh, tweeting us from Mumbai. She says, I personally feel that breeding sites have to be eliminated first. The entire focus remains on treatment and not prevention. What's interesting about her tweet is that she got a, a recommendation from someone in Uganda who's facing the same things. This is sourced, who says, well, as long as those methods don't mess with the soils, a chia crop went to waste as a result of that in a part of Uganda, and he goes on to say the mosquitoes probably have more insecticide resistance now and are worse than before. So, uh, Ankit, I'm wondering if you could pick up on that resistance part because we saw a lot of tweets on that, and, yeah. and that being something uh, that is being counteract, counter, counteracting mm -hmm. some of the efforts to fight this. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely. I think that, that when a malaria program is not carried out properly, also resistance builds so fast, like how you might see antibiotics resistance in the States if a course isn't finished. Um, when we were going to re report this, for example, we were, you know, we're like, what should we do to protect ourselves? And people were like, honestly, just if you get a fever, then get help because none of the prophylactic things are actually going to help you at this point because mo most likely there's resistance to it already. Mm -hmm. um, I think that prevention is a huge thing. I think that um, the environment has to be taken into account because a lot of those breeding sites like streams, et, cet et cetera, are impacted by agriculture and, and mining and a, a lot of different issues. Um, but basically, they found that mosquito nets and the spray inside the house has the largest impact. So those are things we can control and those are things that systems are able to provide if, if they're actually, you know, carried out. And Let me show you a couple of headlines, uh, audience. Have a look here. Government to release plan to end malaria by 2030. So that's an, a headline from the Indian press. This is a headline from the US press. Obama's goal to wipe out malaria may be a dream too far. Let me just remind you that Sonia looked at 500,000 years of malaria. Um, Sonia, is this even possible, this idea, this push for in the next 15 years, we're going to get this done um, and we're going to eradicate malaria. We're going to cut it dramatically. Is that even possible? Well, cutting it dramatically is definitely possible. Um, we have the tools to do that. And so if you if you hit malaria hard enough with a lot of different chemicals, uh, chemical drugs for the parasites, insecticides for the mosquitoes, the nets to protect people from bites, mm -hmm. all of that stuff really works. You can bring malaria right down. The trick is, and the thing that we have not fully figured out how to do is how do you get to zero? Yeah. So you can get it down to a very low level, but what often happens and what has happened historically in many places that still have malaria today uh -huh. is at that point, when at, from that low level, all the chemicals stop working because resistance starts sure. to set in. So the mosquitoes just, just, become resistant, the parasites become resistant. With Dr. Uman, because he works in malaria prone areas. He has never, ever, ever had malaria. Dr. Uman, how do we make that possible for everybody in India? How do we yeah, get the malaria to, to this... zero? If he knew that, okay. he wouldn't be talking zero. to me. <laughs> if he reached somewhere, <laughs> exactly. getting winning the, the Nobel we'll Prize. Have to move across to Washington. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, Living, you know, it's it's more complex than that because you know the the mosquito that causes malaria, for example, there are some 425 species of Anopheles. The particular one oh. in the areas that have the most malaria in India, that's the hilly areas, is a mosquito called Anopheles fluviatilis, which breeds in flowing streams, not in stagnant water, and bites around midnight. So now you need mm -hmm. to cater, or you know, you have to have local and focal kind of approaches. What the WHO says. Uh, to malaria. It, it just one method doesn't work everywhere. So they need, it needs local adaptation. But my argument, I agree with Sonia, it can be done. Zero, I think you'll need a vaccine. Wow. Uh, okay. But for um, bringing it down to, you know, less than burden levels, I think it can be done if we will apply our minds to it. Okay. And also stop looking for one magic bullet, which will do everything. Sure. Uh, right. You know, yeah. right. nets. That's the danger with nets right now. We did that with, um, uh, with uh, you know, spraying insecticides okay. earlier. Now we're doing it with nets, as if you all know right. that's going to solve all the problems. So you need to do words all from of Dr. it. Dr. Uman, Sonia Shah, Dr. Yogesh Jain, and also Ankita Rao. We're taking them online to the post show stream.aldezero.com for more conversation. Before we do that, Malika. This is from Andrea, who says globally and locally led community engagement is critical in raising awareness. Thank you very much, audience, for being part of this conversation. We'll see you online, hopefully. Take care.
Hello again, this is the Genes Online Post Show. We're talking about fighting malaria in India. Let's get right back to that conversation via Dr. Jane. Dr. Jane, what did you want to add to our conversation we've had so far? Yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, after the, uh, the specific suggestion that uh, Johnny made about involving communities who suffer from malaria in control programs, the other uh, specific recommendation, uh, suggestion I would make is that um, when you for, for preventing malaria and for uh, from happening, you require all the principles of public health to be pl uh, put in place. Uh, all the preventive strategies, all the surveillance methods to pick up uh, uh, the uh, the occurrence of malaria, the uh, how the bed nets have been distributed, have the has the insecticide been sprayed in people's houses, and. Uh, uh, these all these control measures should be in place, but also at the same time you require uh, a, a very robust treatment program strategy because uh, whenever people get malaria, they should it should be diagnosed early, and at the same time managed expertly, because uh, when you get severe malaria, uh, malaria complications, you require the highest principles of intensive care to look after them. And the tragedy is that all these intensive care things that you require when you become really sick with malaria are furthest away from where people who are sick with malaria stay. And that is usually the, so for the, the places that require dialysis or they require blood or uh, you know, uh, uh, intensive care are furthest away from areas where tribals or other poor communities stay in this country. Sure, so Dr. Jane, so I showed this headline. A of this. Dr. Jane, I showed this headline. Government to release plan to end malaria by 2030. 2030 for everybody who works in development world is the goal for the sustainable development goal. So everybody's putting their, their big picture plans for the next 15 years or so. So bearing in mind what you said, Dr. Jane, is this possible for India to do, it's a, it's a multi-layered approach you're suggesting. Dr. Uman suggested this as well. Can you do that in 15 years? Can India do that in 15 years, in your opinion? It can, but it will require a paradigm shift in the way we look at the problem, uh, and uh, only then. And I, uh, I'm not very confident about that their ability to do it. So it's possible, but it seems improbable that it would be, poss that it would mm. be done something like that. Sonia, I want to throw something to you. We just got, this is just a minute ago, Kate tweeted in after joining our show. She says, I've just joined this discussion, and she has a question. Might there be any negative consequences of eliminating malaria in terms of the ecosystem and related resistances? This is an awesome question, I think, because it's something I, I hadn't even question. thought about. And Sonia, I thought you might be best to answer it, especially given in some of the research we were doing for this show, we read about uh, a, a process to perhaps genetically engineer some mosquitoes so that they can't pre procreate. What, what do you make of the, ter the, the consequences this might have? You know, this is something I looked into really deeply because I, I felt certain that, you know, there's a big push, in, and there still is, but historically there have been times when people have said, well, let's just eradicate mosquitoes. Let's just get rid of all the mosquitoes because then we'll get rid of malaria and we won't have these pests around, and why don't we just do that? And, of course, human beings are really good at making other species go extinct for better or worse. So usually we do it by mistake. Um, so could we do this on purpose? Could we actually get rid of all mosquitoes? And, and I thought, well, surely if you get rid of a whole species, some, something terrible would happen. You know, there's the fabric of life and, you know, so, and I couldn't really get any biologist, any fly biologist to specifically tell me who would suffer in the ecosystem if there's no more mosquitoes. But if you did get, when you get rid of one thing in the environment, you create a new niche, right? There's an open niche. And what we know about nature is that nature f fills its niches. So something else will rush in to take the place of that. Now, in terms of infectious diseases, we've gotten rid of other ones. We got rid of smallpox, for example, and we didn't have some new pox virus take over. So to my mind, we could get rid of malaria parasites. That doesn't mean getting rid of malaria mosquitoes, of course, but we could get rid of malaria parasites and just be a little bit healthier for it, right? I don't, I don't, I think the 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 net effect ecologically is people. There'll be more people who survive malaria, who who survive without having, uh, you know, their lives exacted by malaria. 
Let me show you something here because we've been talking about Ankita's Rao's uh, investigation, uh, which she did with her partner, who you heard from a little bit earlier, revealed the malaria crisis India doesn't want to acknowledge. What kind of ripples has this made, Ankita? Have there been any? The report? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it actually got a lot of attention, at least online. Um, Unfortunately, we haven't heard from people in the government yet, but we know that it's been circulated right. within the World Bank, um, within you know global aid development How do you communities. Because um, people have written to us because they've told us that they, that they were sending it out on their listservs, right. and um, I mean everything's been quite supportive, which makes me wonder where the government is, because that's who I really want to hear from, yeah. of course. Um, but I, I think that I think that what we did is something that um, people enjoyed because it connected the dots, because people knew there was procurement problems, people knew there was a poverty inequality aspect, people knew there was you know, a political, you know, the end of political um, power, but no one sort of put that together, and I think that people finally got to see the connected dots. What shocked you the most? What was the moment where you just thought, I cannot believe this is happening? I mean, if we, when we talk about um, Ratla, Ratna Lama Rasa, the woman um, in, who leads into that, our story, just to get to her village, we had to cross, it was monsoon season, we crossed by foot, um, you know, two rivers to get there and up hills. And if it took us that long to get up there, I mean, how are people accessing care in those areas, right? And then you go to her, her house, um, her, her kids are sitting around. It's, extreme poverty, extreme malnourishment everywhere you look. How are they and, accessing care? Um, there's, so there's, loc there's government clinics, but when you walk into them, half the time they're understaffed, as I mentioned before. Um, there are ambulances, but calling them is a problem. They pay for private cars sometimes. They, for her, they actually carried her like over a, f a few kilometers out. Um, so I think that even though I knew that, I hadn't seen it. Um, and. I think seeing that, you know, people like us, like we have access to gyms and doctors and we yeah. still get sick and we still make mistakes. Yeah. But in that kind of environment, I mean, you know, the lack of knowledge coupled with the lack of facilities, it's, I mean, it's heartbreaking actually, yeah. So there are two things I want you to pay attention to, audience. One is uh, the report that Ankita has put out here on Al Jazeera America, revealed the malaria crisis India doesn't want to acknowledge. And there's a, a great TEDx talk, Sonia Shah's Three Reasons We Still Haven't Gotten Rid of Malaria. It's a great talk, um, and here you can see a, a giant um, mosquito. Uh, the thing that, that resonated with me, Sonia, from this talk was, I spent some time in Mozambique, and I was working with colleagues, and they said, I don't feel well today. And I was like, what's wrong? He's like, I've got a bit of malaria. <laughs> and he just, you know, like, I, oh, I've got an ache. That's how, like, I would say when I come to work. And they would come to work with malaria, and they'd be like, it'd be fine. And I was like, well, what are you taking? Nothing. And they just got a bit of malaria, and they just carried on. I know in your TEDx talk, you said that was one of the reasons why we're still fighting malaria, because the people who are most affected by it don't necessarily take it that seriously. Can you explain? Yeah. Well, well uh, a, a typical child in a highly malarious place, um, say in Malawi or somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa where there's really a lot of falciparum malaria, the most deadly kind of malaria, might have a dozen episodes of malaria before they turn two. Mm. So if they survive that, you know, they'll have acquired immunity. They'll still get malaria again and again and again, but they're much less likely to get to, to die of it. Um, so in their own lived experience, malaria is something that comes and goes. And so I think a lot of pl a lot of people in places where there's a lot of malaria think of malaria the way those of us who live in um, the West in temperate climates think of the cold and flu. Mm. It's something that comes and goes. Now a lot of people die of flu every year. Yes. But we don't think of it that <laughs> way because that, most of we? us yeah. don't actually die of yeah. a flu because yeah. there's so but there's so much flu that yeah. that tiny proportion of people who do die of flu adds up to a big number and it's this really the same kind of thing with malaria where there's a lot a lot of malaria that is occurring that isn't necessarily leading to deaths it's actually usually just resolving on its own now that's not to say that having a high burden of malaria 
at that level is not a huge burden because it is. It drains societies. It contributes to illness from other to other causes. Um, you know, it contributes to uh, recessions in the economy. There's all kinds of follow-on effects of having a lot of malaria in your society. But it still allows the risk perception to be sure. that, well, malaria is a normal, a normal yeah, part of life. A little bit it's of malaria normal. today. All right. So, yeah. guess it's been fascinating talking to you about um, a disease that is it's so prevalent around the world. Um, and yet we haven't won that battle between sort of malaria and a lot of the developing world. So I really appreciate your takes today um, and, and Kita for your reporting, really appreciate that too. Malika, where would you like to leave us? Oh, I'll leave us with your co-author of the report who we heard a video comment from. This is Vivek who gives us two tweets summing this up saying, we tried to explain the corruption and misgovernance that afflict one type of procurement, malaria control. What's important to remember is that these obscure disputes occurring in Delhi boardrooms have huge humanitarian consequences, which you've heard here on today's show. All right, so thank you very much to our guests, Ankita Rao, Dr. Yogesh Jain, Dr. Johnny Uman, and Sonia Shah. We really appreciate your time on the stream. Take care, everybody.